Hello, hello. Welcome everyone to our webinar today. Thank you for joining the official uh, 2022 Contact Center Trends webinar. My name is Jared and I lead our content and communication here for uh, Mindful, which means I have the wonderful privilege of hosting you all today. Trends are not only predictors, they're, they're mile markers as you progress your contact center and overall customer experience. And these mile markers give you an idea of vision and goals that you can forecast with your team as well as your broader company to make sure that you're evolving your customer experience to, to exceed their expectations. So let's, let's get a quick overview of the five trends that we're looking at today. We're looking at uh, omni-channel support and digging into progressive customer expectations. And we'll discuss the prevalence of high call volume, which has been a constant for the, the last two years. Um, we'll look at agent engagement as it's top of mind as staffing continues to be a journey for many brands. So we'll explore that trend. Another interesting topic that we'll look at is uh, how contact centers are beginning to drive revenue, not just mitigate costs. And finally, we'll wrap up with uh, the shining star we all thought would become sentient and have taken over the world by now. Yeah, uh, it's ar artificial intelligence in, in the contact center. I have a couple of the most intelligent people I get to work with joining me today to talk about their observations of, of these trends in the market. So first, I'll introduce Jeremy Starcher. Jeremy is uh, our head of business development. Jeremy has over two decades of experience working directly with uh, contact center owners, operators, and executives, and is well known for his vision of what's coming next for the customer experience. So thanks for joining and bringing some of that vision to today's uh, session, Jeremy. So happy to be here, Jared. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks. And alongside Jeremy, we get to hear from Jay Power. Jay is the head of solutions engineering for Mindful and has helped clients uh, expertly pioneer solutions to get ahead of some of these trends. Uh, so Jay, thanks for joining. I'm sure our audience is looking forward to uh, picking your brain today. Absolutely. These are, uh, these are the great and fun conversations we get to have. It's exciting. So thanks for having us. Awesome. All right. Jeremy, Jay, and I uh, are proud to represent Mindful, a total experience solution that turns every customer touch point into a loyalty, inspiring, and memorable experience that makes agents happy and brands efficient. We offer the very best in virtual queuing, channel transitions, and uh, voice of customer strategies, and have been elevating contact centers and customer experiences for more than 25 years. So I'm excited to bring that history of experience to the table as well today. So let's jump into this first trend and kick it off with omni-channel. Omni-channel support has become the standard that customers expect. Customer expectations of support have changed. I'm sure that's, that's nothing new to you all on the phone. Call centers used to provide support, you know, just over uh, voice, but they're adopting omnichannel as the new support standard. And now many customers start their support journey online, um, looking on your website, sending an email or contacting your support team via social media. Uh, and, and so all of that has, has changed drastically and continues to change. So next up, we're going to hear from uh, one of our, our clients at 1-800-PACRAT, a big moving and storage company, and, and Tiffany is the chief technology officer over there. And um, I asked her about their omni-channel tactics to hear about research they conducted that has steered them toward meeting customers where they are uh, at any given point. So so let's take a second and, and hear from Tiffany. You know, first, everything was operated on the phone and every, you had to talk to a human to get all of your transactions accomplished. Then there was this uh, kind of shift into everything needs to be self-service. And that was, you know, kind of stated really generically, everything needs to be self-service. Millennials and other generations don't want to don't want to speak or ever have contact with the human. They want to do everything from a self-service perspective. And I think we're now in this phase of settling the, the consumer wants omni-channel. It's not, it's not a, a singular channel that the consumer is looking for. The consumer really wants omni-channel based on um, the complexity of their transaction, how familiar they are with the transaction, um, sales or service that they're purchasing or executing, and where they are in comfort levels with, with uh, different technologies and what is convenient at the time of day that they're trying to interact with us. And then through um, consumer research, what we found is consumers really want to have multiple channels of contact uh, available to them and they want to use them depending on where they are in the life cycle uh, of their experience with us. So if they're looking for ETAs or understanding when their container may arrive or, or may depart, they can accomplish that through a, a text much quicker than they could through a, a call. So it's those types of transactions that 
um, the consumer is is willing and interested to experience on on SMS with our call center. So as part of that experience, we've enabled chat on the website because the customer really wants to engage uh, from a self-service perspective and do things on their own. Uh, and that enables another quick channel for the consumer when they're in a flow or they're in uh, a navigation on the website and they might have a question or they might want a clarification. They don't have to drop the website and go to their phone uh, for SMS or, or call. They can actually just chat right there on the website. So what we're finding from an omni-channel perspective is that the consumer really wants all methods of interaction with the brands. So it's not that all sales should be in these channels and all service should be in these channels, but we're finding that based on uh, where you are in the life cycle, what your consumer preferences are and how complex your order is, um, the consumer really wants all channels available to them and be able to pick which one is going to be most efficient, most clarifying, um, for them at the time. I think what strikes me most about this interview is, is how customer centric their approach is. And, you know, she said it's about meeting the consumer based on where they are in their life cycle and, and what their consumer preferences are. And, um, you know, little question as to, you know, how that needs to work. Um, because she, she knows that, you know, ultimately meeting customer preferences is, the the best way for for a brand to operate. So, Jeremy, I know you get kind of fired up about customer um, preference, and and I'd love to hear what you think about the way uh, Tiffany and one eight hundred Packrat uh, approach Omni Channel. Yeah, I think that they're learning just like most brands are learning that customers are interacting with us in in the moment, and that experiences from the customer's point of view are snapshots of their of their touching with the brand. And so the brand needs to be able to support that customer inside of that snapshot. It's not always appropriate for me to make a phone call or to sit on a chat session. Um, it might be emotionally driven, it could be technology driven, um, but one of the challenges that brands face is how do we fully appreciate and understand the experience that we are creating inside of those specific moments? And then more importantly, how do we weave a narrative around that to full understand the full experience that they're having with the brand. Because as we all know, we have more than just one snapshot with that brand. So being able to weave those together. So it's kind of a multi-layer approach that she's taking, right? She's saying, hey, number one, I need to make sure that my customers can interact with me across any channel that they, they want to uh, interact with me on in that moment. But then number two, we got to be able to make sure to map or to create the thread that pulls all of that together so we can have a full representation and understanding of the total customer experience that the the customer is having. And that's important because that gives you a little bit more visibility into their patterns of behavior or their trends. So you can start to really fine tune your omni-channel approach if you can start to understand what are the, um, the levers or that kind of move people to go to chat in an instant or move people to go to a a phone call, for instance. So I love that interview. I think it's just a perfect example of what brands are faced with with an omnichannel strategy. With that, I think that's a perfect way to wrap that up and, and move into uh, next trend, call volume. Um, call volume, I, I hope that's not a trigger word for some of the folks on this on this call. Um, we, we know that they continue to rise and have, you know, it seemed like at the beginning of 2020, uh, you know, everything was on fire and, um, very little has been staved off, certainly from a contact center perspective. So it's really interesting to see, you know, as call volumes continue at their pace, uh, we th we see contact centers are thinking beyond just, you know, answering phone calls beyond just that simple voice to voice uh, experience. And, you know, pairing these uh, consumer expectations with call volume brings contact centers to a unique predicament. Vol volume continues to, to rise. Um, if you're watching this webinar today, this is, you know, real life for you each and every day. And yet customer expectations have shifted. They expect to be met when, where, and how is best for them. So, you know, how do you meet rising demand? Um, Tiffany mentioned utilizing chat at 1-800-PACK-RAT, and chat is obviously a, a great way to offer self-serve uh, deflections and allow agents to multitask conversations. But, you know, uh, containment and resolution um, are both issues. Uh, here's an experience with a client of ours, um, a big box and, and e-commerce retailer. You know, they start service options with a chat bot, but here's where, uh, you know, opportunity comes in around 15% of problems are solved in chat 
which means 85% are escalated to an agent. Uh, you know, we'll talk about AI and escalation a bit later, but the interesting piece here is that uh, of that that big escalation volume, you know, 60% choose a live chat while 40% choose a, a voice conversation. So, you know, we we helped implement the solution with them that, that allows customers to request a call at the point of that chat where they need to talk to someone um, and escalate to to phone or or to a live person. And this allows the brand to still, you know, meet the customer uh, when they're online, while also being able to track the experience across channels and staff more predictably, most most importantly, when it comes to volume. Another experience I wanted to highlight is this one from uh, WestJet, an airline that that we've worked with for years. They're upfront with their with their customers. They let customers know they have high call volumes, uh, as you can see on on the site, um, and then you know direct customers to schedule a call. And they facilitate this in the IVR as well. If the customer's flight is coming up in the next forty eight hours, then their call is prioritized. Otherwise. You know, the customer has a chance to schedule their call for a time that works for them and, you know, both for them and for the brand and helps them kind of mitigate and, and predict that that volume, smooth those peaks out. So, you know, call scheduling allows them to meet rising demand across the board. And, you know, not only are customers happier about not waiting on hold, but now the, the contact center can staff accordingly and, and almost entirely predict their, their call volumes. Jay, I'm curious what other tactics or strategies you've seen employed to uh, combat some of these rising call volumes. Yeah, I mean, when we we think about what is actually happening here, a lot of times we talk about the the word deflection. We figure out what is the right way to to talk to the customer, and what is the way in which we can get them the information. And what I thought was interesting about that video a minute ago is she mentioned three C words to me that I heard was complexity, comfort, and the last one that I think is important is context. Uh, and so the complexity piece was interesting because she said certain channels are more important for certain types of complexity of the conversation, as well as they select the channel by comfort. So when we see this happening, when we look at the, the strategies, um, they, they're picking what's available by complexity and comfort, but also they, we know that there's, you know, the website, this website is going to be great for the complexity at the time that they need it. But when they transition, what does that transition look like? And that's where the context comes in. And so as another strategy is understanding the intent what is the intent as they engage? And so a lot of times we'll, you know, not just engage with them and give them the offer or the option digitally where they're at, but try to understand what is it that they're asking and how can we take them in a path that's best for them? Uh, so we do those with a digital intent where we can direct them and guide them through a digital journey, which may ultimately end in a voice, may end in a chat, may end in an SMS. So it's kind of keeping those three C's in mind. It's, it's really important in terms of how it works, but the last one being context. Context is the key. You know, it allows me to continue a conversation with someone and knowing that they still know who I am, <laughs> you know, so context is the, the, the main important ingredient between channel. I think that's really interesting. Even it, tying back to this um, conversation around call volume is, you know, if you can, to your point, if you can track that context and that intent through the channels, then um, feasibly that that should lower the time it takes to uh, resolve that issue because you have more information at your fingertips. You have a, a customer that has met with, um, you know, understanding and realization of who they are as a person. And so they're not going to be as frustrated about having to repeat themselves, which means that there's no, you know, wasted time venting. And so even though volume might be a struggle, if that resolution time gets shortened, um, then that's, you know, that's better for everyone. Well, the other thing, the, the other side of context is it, it drives more business outcomes and customer uh, success outcomes when it informs the ecosystem of the business. And what I mean by that is it's not just the contact center that understands the, the data or the context of the user. It's also marketing. It's also your digital team. It's also these other teams that sit on the periphery of the contact center that that context means a lot to them because it drives their business decision and ultimately what they do. So we think about that when it comes to a revenue generating website and what what is the journey on the site and how is it used before they come to a voice and how can that inform marketing and the digital team to understand how they structure and engage with the customer through that port before they ever can get to the contact center. So that's that context that makes its way throughout the ecosystem of the business. That's really important to think about. And I think the reason why we're seeing an increase focus on the, the tactical aspects of everything we're just talking about is because COVID really reminded us what happens when you have more calls than people that can answer the call. And 
unfortunately, COVID changed both of those uh, components to the model, right? We had an increase of call volume coming into brands because of concerns and fears. Our entire way of life was disrupted. So everything slowed down. Even how, how quickly can I get a gallon of milk in my grocery store uh, slowed down. So your, your concern, the volumes went up as a result of that. But at the same exact time, brands were forced to go home with at-home agents. At-home agents decided to leave the workforce. So we now increased the volume and we decreased the number of people who are handling it, creating this this situation that most brands haven't felt for decades because they've they've fixed that problem through workforce management practices or through best place case uh, case routing, right? So what's really interesting about this conversation is now people are starting to link the two together that, hey, if we can find a way to A, manage the inbound volume that we have without it coming through our IVR and hitting into a hold situation, which just exacerbates everything, and if we could find a way to provide meaningful context about what that call is about in the first place, then we can provide a more accurate picture of what my staffing truly needs to be because I'm not going to have people calling in, hanging up, calling in, hanging up, calling in and hanging up, as well as inform the agent population that's there. And what we're learning is that the agent experience is as important as the customer experience in this time frame. If you have unhappy agents, you will have long hold times. You're going to have lots and lots of problems downstream. So it's just interesting how COVID has kind of taken us back a few decades in terms of what's important to us. But it's a great reminder that at the end of the day, we're human beings. And sometimes we just got to talk to each other. I think that's a, a perfect segue into our next trend. Agent engagement is is top of mind. I keep seeing articles written about it and and people diving into, you know, how do we train, retain, uh, and engage our agents to, to make them happier and stay longer. And uh, put it, putting it quite frankly, you know, agent engagement will either make or break your contact center and uh, as a whole, your, your customer experience and, and the brand perception. Talking about the agents that are desperately trying to service that rising call volume seems like, uh, you know, the perfect next step. I want to talk about this trend by looking at a few studies and, uh, and publications. So this first one is from Gartner uh, from last summer. And in their poll of agents, they find that only one in three are engaged at their job. Uh, Brent Adamson uh, is the, the Gartner vice president in the customer service and support practice. And he writes this, he says, disengaged reps engage in behaviors that drive a high effort customer service experience three times as often as their engaged counterparts. These behaviors include failing to provide first contact resolution, making customers repeat information, and failing to reduce the number of steps customers must take to resolve their issues. Therefore, reps are much more likely to provide a poor customer service experience, negatively impacting loyalty and customer outcomes. And while the customer experience is obviously the outcome you want to focus on the most as a brand, uh, you know we see very clearly, uh, very clear indicators of how the agent experience funnels into that. The problems contact centers face are cyclical. You know, remote work has changed the game for many agents, opening them up to look for more competitive positions outside of their geography. Uh, so agents are leaving. As a result, queues are stacking up. Agent pressure is high. Agents then are overloaded, undervalued. Naturally, they start looking for other jobs. And so obviously this is like a turnover um, focused cycle, but but you could you could change that factor out for a variety of other engagement topics um, within, you know, within the agent experience. So what should brands be doing to, to counteract these effects? Uh, I did want to call out one example from one of our brands. Uh, so like many brands, our, our client uh, Aflac was facing issues with short, short staffing and queues were, uh, were simply unmanageable. So we partnered together to deploy a schedule only strategy, which meant callers uh, into their contact center had to schedule, uh, schedule their conversations with an agent. Um, you know, waiting on hold wasn't wasn't an option. So uh, the results were were staggering, and agents uh, across the organizations were shocked at the end of the day, cheerfully saying, "You know, this is the first time I've gone home um, since I I can remember." And you know, customers also uh, benefited from a better experience, granting them a predictable time to receive a call that worked for both them and the contact center uh, efficiency. So I the the fact that you know folks were able to say like 
end end their day and and not be asked to stay later um not not have a stressful you know overwhelming queue uh when when it's time to clock out uh what a, what a difference in in agent happiness and experience and so i want to pose it to you guys jeremy i'm interested to hear what you see as methods for audience to improve uh, agent experience and retention well, the very first thing is to recognize that the agent is your most valuable resource and it goes beyond just the amount of money it, it costs to have the agents in your environment. They are the human side to your brand. And if they're not feeling humanized, then they're not going to have human interactions with, with your customers. So anything that you can do to empower them, keep them engaged in, in what's going on in the business, um, educate them. Um, listen to them is going to come back to you tenfold. When you can ex include experiences like the one Jared just mentioned, where the agents can go home for the first time without having to do overtime. And what that shows is that you're respecting them as a human being, that you're saying to them, we value you. And you see this because another trend we're going to get into in a couple of minutes is going to be about AI. And a large part of the AI investment going on right now in our space is around how do we assist our agents become better agents. So I think anything we can do to humanize, and I, that's probably the wrong word, but uh, our, the agent is going, to, uh, is going to help across the board. Yeah, Jeremy, if I could piggyback on that just a second. The, the, the feedback that you talked about, I mean, let's just let's, let's be straight. Managing people is, is, can be a challenge and understanding the challenges they have in order to be successful in their job is not always the easiest. And we can be overloaded with dashboards and, um, you know, metrics and all sorts of information. But one of the things that we hear about, you know, uh, we, we do a lot with voice of the customer and creating that survey feedback loop with those customers about their interaction with the brand. We're starting to hear much more about also the voice of the agent and connecting the voice of the agent with the voice of the customer in that single experience to ask questions about, you know, did you have the right tools? Were you prepared? Was there, you know, resources? How could we do better kind of thing? And then you have the customer context of what they thought about it with the agent context together to evaluate what's the right outcome of that. Or is there a situation where, you know, there needs to be some training or focus applied, or is there a way we can do things better? And it is really as interesting that voice of the agent piece and how it ties into the voice of the customer to ultimately provide a better successful, you know, outcome. And that doesn't surprise, it didn't surprise us, right, Jay? Because we are accustomed to walking into a new customer of ours, walking in and the agents meeting us and saying, oh my God, you're the callback guys. We love you, right? And, and the reason why they're saying that is because one of the most stressful experiences that an agent has is during a time when you have too many calls. There's a ton of calls in there. They're getting pressure from their supervisor to answer the next call. They're being measured against their handle time. And at the same time, they're listening to all of the customers complain to them when they get on the call. I can't believe I had to wait for 10 minutes. And there's just all kinds of really pent up emotion when it comes to hold time in the contact center. Our callback technology removes all of that. And so as a result, when the agent is in that situation and they're handling calls that are coming from our system, the interaction is positive from the very beginning. Wow, thanks for calling me back. This is such a great experience. And it gives the agent that kind of breath that they need during a time where traditionally they would have been under a tremendous amount of pressure. Well, there's nothing like that dashboard for an agent to look up and seeing all those calls coming in. Like that Aflac example, part of that was people would call in, abandon, recall back in, abandon. I mean, I, I talked to one contact center and they had one person single-handedly call in almost 500 to 1,000 times in a day. And so you think about that. Once they get scheduled their callback, we don't allow another call, <laughs> call back. They get their callback. There's no redundancy. There's no duplication. And so to look up and see that they know exactly how many calls they could handle and when they're going to be done, that was, that's a what big a difference. deal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, switching gears, uh, I want to go into our next trend and look at revenue. Um, brands are realizing that human interaction obviously builds trust and that trust can develop into selling opportunities. And the contact center has always been, you know, seen as a, as a cost center with efforts focused on, you know, keeping deflection high and customers away. And, um, and it's now being transformed into, you know, a revenue center as business leaders uh, interpret the value 
or rather reinterpret the value of, you know, a voice interaction. So I have another clip from Tiffany that I want to play here uh, for context. 1-800-PACRAT uses their contact center to drive um, revenue. They have sales uh, folks in, in the contact center, even though it's listed technically as, you know, a, a cost on their, their P&L. So I thought that was interesting context to hear from um, as we listen to this clip from Tiffany. From a um, engagement perspective, we start with the shopping experience. 85% of our uh, lead experience begins in a digital channel. And through either a, a paid digital channel or an organic digital channel, they will find one of our brands, typically. And then they engage in the website for uh, research and an understanding of what the potential price point could be through a quote. Um, and then to convert that quote uh, to an actual move or a storage order, um, it, can, it would, would typically be done through the call center um, or online. So um, because of that infrequency of purchase in the moving space, and the fact that it is not an insignificant um, cost to move, um, we find that consumers are still very hesitant to actually book online uh, because moving is stressful, um, moving is, is foreign to them. It's a, um, it's a aspect that they're having to deal with, with while other changes are going on in their life, like, um, you know, um, changing schools, changing jobs, so forth. So what we find is they prefer the, the comfort of speaking with a live person. Call center sales, call center service are both um, cost centers on, on the PL. However, they support lines of business that have that are the profit centers. And the two line, the two main lines of business are moving and storage. Um, so obviously the call center sales team is um, integral to uh, meeting the profit or the revenue um, that is budgeted on those respective PLs. I also want to weave this in. We had the chance to talk to Joe Eisner, previously a global lead of Amazon Connect at AWS. And, and here he talks about how many brands are missing out by not utilizing voice experiences to drive revenue. There are a lot of you know companies in our space who like to talk about the uh, the diminution of voice as an enabler for customer service and the advent of digital channels and taking over for voice. And yet, as you pointed out, the statistics show that when most consumers are faced with major, making major purchases or resolving major questions about purchase decisions, the call, you know, the customer journey may may go across, you know, five or more channels, but the majority end in a voice call. And um, you know, to your point earlier about uh, you know, a voice not just being an enabler for customer service, but also for sales. And I think, you know, my, our hope is that customers will uh, understand the importance and compellingness of voice interactions to address major, you know, revenue conversion and sales opportunities and take advantage of that and capitalize on it to increase, you know, to, to stop looking at contact centers merely as a cost center and a problem resol resolution focus, but, but more so as a revenue enhancer and sales enabler. Jeremy, I know you have uh, thoughts on this trend and the opportunity brands have to to leverage their human assets to drive sales. I'd love to hear what you think. Absolutely. Well, you know, we heard earlier that in most cases when there is a large purchase like um, uh, a container for moving or storage, there's a ton of emotion that go along with that purchase. It's not just about who has the best container. Um, and understanding the entire experience that a customer is going through at that point in time is going to be critical to being able to provide them with the best resource for them in that moment. And I think what Joe was trying to say there is more than not on a complicated, complex, or personal sale, there is a human-to-human -human connection that is required in order for that sale to, to go through. Um, 
And so it's important that brands start to look at their human resources in the contact center as not just someone who's going to answer the guy that's going to call in and say, I forgot my password, right? Um, or call in and say, this is why I can't pay my bill. You know, there's those service calls that we have to take uh, in order to stay in business, but we really don't want to spend a lot of money to resolve. On the flip side of that, the folks who they're a human being can talk to that person and say, okay, and show compassion. And in that moment could open up all kinds of opportunities for you on the sale, on the service side. But what we're seeing is that there's a growing trend on staffing uh, sales agents inside of the contact center and linking that sale back to a digital channel. I think we heard that uh, earlier as well, where 85% of all the sales start in a digital channel. Um, but uh, the primary place for them to actually complete the sale is with the human being. Since we've seen, uh, I don't want to say a decline, but since we've seen less people going into a brick and mortar store, it's created an environment where people are now calling, whether that's their local pack rat or whether it's calling the contact center. So again, we go back to that human element of, of everything. The agent can not only bring the expertise that's needed to help the consumer make the decision that they need to make, but they could also bring that compassion and can bring that human side to the conversation that you just can't get when you're sitting in front of a computer screen on a stagnant website. Yeah, it's a, it's a, going back, it's that comfort and com complexity uh, metric, you know, what's the complexity, what's the comfort, and it drives your channel. And I think what's interesting about the the revenue dr driver that we see and I hear about a lot is the conversion of the opportunity. And if you think about it, most conversions happen after a process. You fill out a form, you do something on the website, and you're converted into a call. That's a process-driven conversion because at the end of it, you know you're going to hit a call. Early conversion is what we hear and talk about is how do you capture the ones who never make it to a call? How do you convert that opportunity into a real opportunity prior to them failing out, getting you know, distracted, a little bit concerned with clicking a button, whatever is giving them the opportunity to say, Hey, you made it halfway through this form. Would you like to speak to someone to fill it out? Maybe the form asked a question that's a sensitive comfort driven question that they'd rather speak to someone to fill out. And so if you see that creating that into the digital journey to recognize the comfort level has changed and giving them the option to speak to someone is something we talk about more often now. You know, you just, you sparked something there, Jay. Um, she mentioned that even in their business model, the agents are still considered a cost center, right? And if we know that customers are more likely to interact with you on a voice channel an hour from now because it's more convenient for them, and we offer them that inside of that digital, so there's that convenience factor, don't know if that was part of your C's. I think I might just added a C into your equation. Oh, good. Four C's now. <laughs> that uh, that would allow contact centers to not to have, not to overstaff sales agents, thereby allowing them to continue to kind of decrease their expense to ratio component that they're probably measuring against those those contact center agents. So it just it just kind of the convenience factor for the customer can create a huge, huge benefit from a cost perspective to the uh, the contact center. Yeah, predictability. Well, that's not a C. So you have to find another word. <laughs> I'll figure out another one. <laughs> awesome. Great. Well, that that leads us into uh, our last trend. Contact centers have adopted AI to improve efficiency, and you know the the hottest one of the hottest trends right now. I'm I'm seeing a ton of authors and and publishers putting thought pieces out there um, around AI's usefulness in in the customer experience. And you know AI is is nothing new to uh, our audience, and and certainly if you're an enterprise brand, like this is nothing new. Um, but certainly the way that it's being um, viewed and seen and adopted and a lot of times um, not only adopted but uh, now we're in a stage of how is it utilized maybe we've adopted it a while back because AI has been um, you know a, a area of a lot of investment from from recent years um, but figuring out how to utilize it in the best way that that provides both a fantastic customer experience um, a non frustrating customer experience as well as you know, efficiency for the brand um, is kind of the area that that we're in. So 
First, a couple more tidbits from industry leaders before I open it up to Jay and Jeremy. Um, there are a few comments I want to look at from, from some of the market leaders. So here's a quote from uh, G2 Patel, which is Cisco's executive vice Pre president and general manager of security and collaboration. Um, AI services help remove friction for the user while equipping the agent with important customer information. This sort of mixed mode of human interaction uh, coupled with AI can go a long way toward improving an experience uh, many customers find aggravating and time consuming. What you need is a bot that is smart enough to say, let me connect you with an agent you can answer, uh, who can answer that, that question for you. And that connection with the agent should be seamless, Patel said. And moving on to another from Colin Crowley, who is uh, the CX advisor at Freshworks, he wrote, and said, I feel the most promising area of AI is in AI systems that are employee facing or agent facing rather than customer facing because they impact the customer so directly and can provide a bad experience if not done well. Uh, they are inherently higher risk. More and more AI companies are focusing on the agent experience by empowering agent with crucial live support, such as, you know, recommended answers to customer questions based on what worked well with other customers in the past. As they navigate real time digital channels like live chat and social messaging, and this has the ability to change the agent experience significantly and vastly increase efficiency, standardization, and quality of service across digital channels. So uh, obviously AI uh, is, is wh whether it's top of mind for you directly in your contact center or, um, or not, it is likely top of mind for at least someone in your, um, in your brand. And, and you know big budgets are going toward AI and so I, I want to open this up to Jay. Um, what are you seeing on on our client side uh, with with folks utilizing or um, leveraging AI in their contact centers or customer experiences? <laughs> Primarily, it's funny, you know, looking at that those statistics and where things are used. When you think about AI, it's typically an enhancement in an area, so a specific channel approach to AI. Um, you know, so when you think about the voice experience, talking with an agent, every time I think about AI as an enhancement, I think about like Iron Man, you know, you're stepping into a suit of something that's going to assist you, make you stronger at the core of the suit is still human. And so if you think about AI for your agent, it is an enhancement that can assist you getting through training faster because the AI is helping them with engage of what to say. But the most important piece, the human experience is what the agent brings. And that's something the AI is not bringing, but it's an enhancement to them. It's that suit of armor they can put on to be the superhero for that customer. Um, what's interesting about it is that, and we, you know, this has been around for a while is that the empathy economics of it is how AI is used to understand the empathy of the customer and their preference and how their entire journey focused. Cause if you think about it, AI is driven by a channel approach and chat maybe, or an enhancement within the IVR an enhancement within the, we haven't really seen a, a way in which AI could be used to understand the customer's preferences, the way that it can be understand their empathy as their journey to help them with those transitions and help be their, you know, their Sherpa along the way, so to speak. Um, there is, there is a balance of doing that. So it's not overt, but it's also assisting. So there, that's a, that's an interesting fine line that we talk about and try to think about how AI could assist with that, not just being channel focused, but there is certainly some enhancements in the channel that can drive some greater outcomes. I love that Jay, because it goes right back to our opening conversation about the customer's memory of the experience is a snapshot. And one of the challenges that all brands have is, is creating that narrative that goes across those snapshots. Snapshots. That's where AI is going to bring the most value. It's just not there yet, to your point. It's being used as kind of a scalpel. It's very, very precise. I'm going to use AI in my chat. I'm going to use AI in my IVR. I'm going to use AI um, with my agent desktop, right? But there's there's really been little movement forward in terms of a, a, ja, a Jarvis-like AI, going back to your Iron Man, that can understand the difference between commands that that, you're, that is being given by the customer and to be able to respond back to that. I think the best opportunity for us to personalize it, this customer experience idea, is going to be through AI. You're not going to pay someone to sit around and and follow someone over social media into chat, on the web, into their next door yeah. neighbor conversations, but you are going to start to see all this data is available to us now. And that's, that's what's so scary and striking at the same time. And I think we have been uh, over consumed, if you will, with all of this data, like how, what are we going to do? How are we going to use it? 
But if you take a look at you know where where people are saying we're going to go with the metaverse and what, how this data is going to actually influence every aspect of our life, we're going to need that AI behind it to help guide the steps. And this is where I think brands can really start to push in on AI if they haven't already. How can I use my AI to create a unique and personalized experience for Jeremy because I can, I know exactly what he needs. Going back to that empathy that you're talking about, I am empathetic towards what it is that he needs in that moment. And then and only then will a customer's perception of the brand be more like a memory of a vacation than uh, the memory of just a snapshot in time, just one experience. Fantastic. This has been obviously a, a jam-packed webinar. We've covered so much for, uh, for each of these trends. I hope it's been really inspiring for you, uh, listening and, and joining in. So thank you so much for, for joining and, and spending an hour with us. Um, and big thank you to, uh, to Jay and Jeremy for spending your time with us today. It was great having your perspectives. It was awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. We will see everyone next time. Thanks so much. <laughs>